2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Oh yes, we do, we do have Sunday school and nursery upstairs if, if your children are comfortable with joining. So we, we have a full house this morning, which is great. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and I will get there eventually, I promise, okay? But we're going to begin, I'm going to invite you to travel back in time with me this morning to, to ancient Rome, so if you could think ancient Rome with me for a few moments, okay? Uh, the year is, is 165 B.C., and uh, Rome has been fighting a bitter war against King Perseus of Macedonia. And after much intrigue, uh, lost battles, loss of life, King Perseus of Macedonia, his armies have been defeated, and his family captured the kingdom, Macedonian kingdom, which was very powerful, has lost. Rome's legions have been led to victory by a general, General Lucius Aemilius Paulus. And as custom would go at this time, is he was commanded to come back to Rome with his army and with his spoils of war. The capital of the Roman Republic at this time would welcome its hero back into its midst. And so, a parade route was made in the city of Rome itself, and, uh, you know, grandstands were built along some of the streets and in the Circus Maximus, and many of the citizens of the city and outside the city would come into the city dressed in festive white to celebrate the coming of this victorious general. And keep in mind that, you know, they didn't have television, they didn't have internet, I mean, they didn't even have radio, and so things like this were enormous to experience, yeah? And so they planned a three-day celebration called a Roman triumph. And so on day one, a large group of tump trumpeters would begin the celebration leading an immense procession. So try to just work this out in your mind. If you've seen the movie Ben-Hur, they did a pretty good job of a Roman triumph in there. Um, 1,200 wagons carrying the loot from the Macedonians, from weapons of armor to, uh, you know, their uh, weapons, their pikes, their bows, their javelins, their helmets, their swords. So 1,200 wagons, followed by another 1,200 wagons just filled with the weapons of the Macedonian armor or army. It took almost eight hours for those wagons to make their way through the city. And all the citizens very excited about this, just watching. I mean, and they've never seen anything like this before. And so that was the end of day one, and they would go home, and they're expectant. What's going to happen on day two? Well, on day two, the tremendous wealth of the Macedonians was now paraded through the city. 3,000 slaves carrying 750 large vessels filled to the brim with silver coins, followed by silver bowls and cups and drinking horns, followed by 500 wagons carrying the art of the Macedonians, statues of various gods and goddesses, paintings of once famous men, followed by golden shields, and then also massive paintings that had been done for the king, all being brought through for everyone to see. They went home. Excited about day three. Day three started with 120 sacrificial oxen being taken through the streets. They would be sacrificed at the end of the uh, parade route. Followed by 77 vessels filled with gold coins. 
a vast display of golden tableware that had belonged to King Perseus himself. 200 ivory tusks from elephants being taken through. The king's chariot, his armor, the crown that he used to wear, showing that he was king. Next, his horses brought with their armor, all going through the city. Then hundreds, maybe thousands of Macedonian soldiers who were now slaves in irons, making their way slowly through the city. Then there was a dramatic pause in the parade. There's two young boys and a young girl. And they were the sons and daughter of the conquered king. And they were accompanied by their tutors, their teachers. It was very apparent that they were exhausted. They were fearful. They were pleading with the crowds for mercy. And many of the Romans were moved by the sight of these children being taken through the city. So moved that they didn't notice the figure walking behind them. A darkly clad figure in a dark robe, chained, looking as though he's not quite sure where he is. The former king making his way through the streets, trying to comprehend what has taken place. Near him, many of his friends, many of his officers, all filled with grief and faces of defeat. Many would be executed when they reached the end of the parade route. Others, like Perseus himself, would find his way to a dungeon to await his fate. And then there is another dramatic shift in the parade as everyone's watching this. They can hear. They can hear the sound of music. And they can feel almost something like we can feel this morning with the roller rolling by. Well, for them, that was the movement of the victorious troops that were marching through the city, dressed in their best uniforms, with their armor, their shields, their swords, their spears, everything gleaming, flags waving, those, you know, those uh, eagle standards that you're familiar with, carrying those. And there, behind them, was, what? Was nothing. <laughs> was the general. The general. In his chariot. He's got a laurel leaf crown showing that he is victorious. He's holding his, aloft his ivory scepter uh, capped with gold. He's smiling and cheering back at the crowds. They're smiling and cheering back at him. Why? Victory has been won. Rome is at peace, well, at least for now. Enemies vanquished for the moment. And so the city, filled with the sounds of celebration, the shouts of victory, and now this general has a new name. General Lucius Aemilius Paulus Macedonicus showing that he was the one who conquered the Macedonians. This was history in the making, a Roman triumph to remember. I mean, you're hearing about it more than 2,000 years later. Interesting. That's the end of the history lesson for this morning. I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is truth and that it brings life. And we ask, God, as we consider your word this morning, that you would speak life to your people. Lord, please use me to convey the truth of your word, that your people would be ministered to. Perhaps those that don't know you, God, that they would be drawn to you this morning. Lord, help us not to be distracted by the sounds of construction and other things. May we focus on your word in who you are. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, But thanks be to God, 
who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God we speak in Christ. And so this section begins, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Always. It's a small word, isn't it? It means all the time. All the time. Not sometimes. Not just on Tuesdays. Always. Always Christ leads us in triumphal procession, to have victory over. Paul is expressing a thankful certainty to the Corinthians, which carries on into our very day in Christ, that Jesus leads those that are his, those that are in him, in victory. Always. Always? That's what it says. Always. Not sometimes, but all of the time, you and I, in Him, being led in victory. Jesus is leading in victory, even when it may not look like victory, humanly speaking. When Paul wrote this, and he used that phrase, triumphal procession, the Corinthians knew exactly what he was alluding to, the Roman triumphs similar to the one that I just described a moment ago. The grandest celebrations the capital of Rome put on. But in these words, Paul is describing a triumph that's far more glorious and far more significant than one for a Roman general. Because this triumph is celebrating Jesus' victory. A triumph that you and I in Christ that we are in also, because in Christ, we are being led in victory. God is able to always lead us in triumph in Christ, because Christ has already won the victory. This is where I should hear like an amen or two. <laughs> we are victorious because Christ is victorious. He is the conquering general, the king of kings, the Lord of Lords. Now there's only one other place in the New Testament where this Greek word for triumphal procession is used. And in those verses, we get even more insight into where the victory has been won. You can turn there if you like. It's also hopefully going to be on the screen. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 13. It says, And you, yes, you, and me, being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. We, you and I, once outside of Christ, yeah, we considered this in our studies in Ephesians not that long ago, we were spiritually dead. We were trapped in our sins with no way out in ourselves. We were in a place where we were condemned by the law because of the great guilt we were under for breaking God's law. If you don't think that you've broken God's law, let's talk later. Jesus, on the cross, 
won the victory of victories by the life that he gave in death upon the cross and he took up again by rising from the dead, we are allowed to have eternal life, life abundant in him. By his sinless blood that he shed on Calvary, we have been cleansed, we have been washed, we have been forgiven of all of our sins, washed clean in the sight of God, and brought into his family as his children. By his righteousness that he extended to all who accepted him as Savior, we have been given a righteousness that condemns and silences the law, silences our enemies' whispers of guilt against us because in Christ we have been clothed in his righteousness. God sees us as right. Oh boy. Praise God for that. Clothed in Christ's righteousness. And there upon the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of darkness, Satan and his demonic host, who seek to wage war against us. There upon the cross, Paul says here, Jesus triumphed over the forces of evil. God's victory was being won. Jesus was providing the way for us to escape the power of sin, the power of the devil. To remove those spiritual blinders and the bondage of sin and the power of death. Set free. Jesus triumphed over all of them by way of the cross. Paving the way for you and I to be set free. To have abundant life in him. In the present, on into eternity in his coming kingdom cross. That's the way. He won the victory. And the cross reminds us that God's victories, his triumphs, don't always appear to be victorious from a human point of view. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. What matters is that his victories are indeed victories in God's estimation in his economy, which is genuine reality, unlike sinful people's distorted perception of reality. Only a few months after accepting Jesus as my Savior, I was walking with my best friend at the time. Now, he was not very happy that I had become a Christian, not very happy at all. And shortly after we passed a very large and happy-looking Buddha statue out in front of a Chinese restaurant, my friend said this to me. He said, why is there such a contrast between Buddha, who's happy and contented, and Jesus, who's nailed to a cross, dead and defeated? New Christian, good question. <laughs> My simple answer at the time, something like this, because that's what he came to do. That is what he came to do. That is the reality of things. Jesus' death, and he didn't stay there, did he? <laughs> Jesus' death, although from a human perspective may look like failure, it was in fact victory providing the perfect sacrifice for the deliverance of sinners like you and like me. Jesus did not stay dead. He is seated in victory in the heavenlies. That is true victory, which no one else can claim. Buddha's not happening any anymore, just so you know. He's not. That's the reality of it. As we are being led in triumph in Christ in this life, we will experience circumstances, situations, 
that to the world look like failure and defeat. But if we are being led by God, it's victory. It's victory in him no matter what others may think. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what God thinks. I have the task of closing a church in the United Kingdom after pastoring it for 13 years. And many people looked at that and thought, failure. And they still do. But we knew the people that were involved, that's what God was doing. He did something else. It wasn't failure. It was part of the plan. It just looked different than what people would expect. Now half the people aren't going to listen to me anymore. That's okay. Now, here in Colossians, here in Colossians, we're reminded that Satan is a defeated enemy. Jesus' triumphal procession, in a sense, is still moving along. Satan is the defeated one. His defeat is continually being shown by souls that he wishes to see condemned and perish being rescued and redeemed when they embrace the truth of the gospel. Being brought out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the God's kingdom of light. Chains and eternal punishment are coming Satan's way. You know, people, they like reserved parking places. That's my spot. Don't park there. He has a reserved spot in the lake of fire. For him, for eternity. It's Satan's spot, and that's where he's going. God has already planned it out. Paul is pointing us to the reality that the supreme battle, the main engagement, that that has been won. The victory has already been secured on the cross. It's true that we still encounter opposition, we encounter difficulties in this life, but they cannot prevail over us in Christ because the real war has already been won by Jesus. He won it on the cross. That's where it was done. We are victorious because Christ is victorious. The victory already won. Now, it may seem, it may seem at times like the full battle, the full engagement is still raging on. Yeah. But in reality, what we experience in the here and now is likened to, I don't know, arrows, cannon shot, a missile or two of a retreating army that knows they've lost the main engagement. They know. They're merely venting their anger because they have lost. The war is finished for them. They may continue to attack. They might let arrow or two fly. They might shoot their cannon or missiles. They might set an ambush here or there. But the battle that decides the victory, <laughs> the decisive outcome of the war, it's already been won in Jesus our captain, our Lord of hosts, who is soon returning to show that he has, he's won. And he's going to sort this place out that's a big mess right now, if we haven't noticed. Yeah? Jesus has won the battle. So when we encounter difficulties in this life, may we see them in that perspective, that the difficulties, the attacks that we face, they've already been defeated in Christ. They have no bearing on our eternal state in Christ. And God is actually able to turn them around for our eternal benefit. Paul wrote this in Romans, Romans 5. Through him, Jesus we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Although things may be difficult in the present, we need not worry, but keep our eyes on our general, Jesus, who promises that he is leading us in triumph, that he is leading us from victory to victory. Because if God is for us, the scriptures ask, who can stand against us? Nobody. Nobody. Because Christ has already won the victory. Romans 8, verse 38. Paul again. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, present, nor things to come this week or next, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. They can't undo the work of the fact that we're in Christ, that we know Him, and that we're headed to eternity. Even when death comes, when death comes, we have not lost. Because we can say like Paul, <clears throat> To live is Christ, and to die is advantage. It's gain. Why is it advantage? Why is it gain? Well, to die is to be with Jesus. We gain. We enter into the presence of our loving Savior. That is gain. We do not lose. You and I, in Christ, a cup of water, please, anyone. <laughs> In Christ, we are in a win-win situation. Yeah? We cannot lose in Christ. As Paul wrote, in contrast to the many trials that we face, Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. God bless you. Thank you. More than conquerors through him. My voice, it's leaving. But water is a beautiful thing. A gift from God. <laughs> Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors? That phrase, it means, it's speaking of a complete, decisive Victory over an adversary. In Christ, we have complete, decisive victory over the many adversaries that face us. The world, the flesh, the devil. Defeated in Christ. And so no matter what the difficulties that we face, or the trials that we walk through, <clears throat> may we see it with the perspective of Christ already having won the victory. No matter what befalls us, to be in Christ is to be more than a conqueror. It's what it says. There's been some great conquerors, world speaking. Hannibal, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Genghis Khan. They've had victories. They've taken ground. They've made names for themselves. We're talking about them right now. But they won nothing in comparison to the victory that was won by Jesus on the cross. They won nothing. Absolutely nothing. We are victorious because Christ is victorious. And he has graciously granted to share that victory, not because of any works that we have done, but because of what he did what he did. We've been called to believe, to have faith in Jesus and his victory, his finished work, and walk in that belief 
with him throughout this life. All right, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14. Through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. That word fragrance, it means odor or smell, just so you know. God's desire is to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Through the lives of people like you and people like me. Do you remember in John's gospel when Mary anointed Jesus with that spikenard? She broke that alabaster flask that contained the oil to anoint Jesus. And John writes, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The whole house, it was filled. God desires that our lives would be the fragrance of Christ to others. Filling our lives wherever we go, that we would be a scent of Jesus. <laughs> you know, sometimes God has to break us like that alabaster flask. He has to break us of ourselves in order to make the way for his fragrance, for his life to be more clearly evident from our lives. God can use suffering as a tool to make Jesus more distinctly smelt from our lives. In the next verse, we get a clearer idea of what this fragrance smells like. Verse 15. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Oh, this fragrance, it's an aroma. It's a sweet, pleasant aroma. It says to God that we are a sweet, pleasing aroma to him. We're well-pleasing to him. Like that offering of the incense in the Old Testament sacrifices. It's a good smell. Whatever you think is a good smell this morning. Those cookies that are just getting ready to come out of the oven. I don't know, the morning coffee. Yeah. A sizzling steak. I think that's John's. Yeah. A good smell, right? Now the aroma of Christ... Coming from our lives, it should be noticeable to those around us. Verse 16. To one, a fragrance from death to death. That doesn't sound good. To other, a fragrance from life to life. To God, we are a sweet-smelling aroma to him. To other believers, we should be a, a pleasing smell to them from life to life. Fellowship in Christ, I'm sure you may have experienced it. You meet somebody, you're in a new city, you don't know anybody, and you just come across somebody, and you start to talk to them, and you go, they know Jesus. I know. How do you know? Because you can smell Jesus, the fragrance of Jesus coming through their life. And there's this immediate bond of fellowship. And so we can have this aroma one unto another, the fragrance of Christ. It's well-pleasing to God. It's well-pleasing to other believers. And it's also pleasing to those who are searching. Maybe they're being drawn by the Holy Spirit. They're attracted to that aroma of Christ. They don't know what it is that's coming from your life, but you're different. And they want to know what that difference is. So it's from life to life. But then there's the others. <laughs> the others. They love their darkness. They love the scent of decay and death. And so the, the smell, the aroma of life to them, it's not sweet. It's death to them. Our presence reminds them of their sin and their rejection of God. So they're repelled by us. 
That's why when I mentioned my best friend at the time when I accepted Christ, that it was pretty quick that I lost most of my friends. Not intentionally, but because now I had the aroma of life and they really liked the aroma of death. Praise God, out of the seven of us, God has saved five of us now. So pray for those two. <laughs> right? For them, it's death. It's death. It drives them away. Now, one thing about the Roman triumph that I did not mention earlier, so I didn't want to completely overwhelm you with the history, but it was also fragrant. The streets of Rome did not always smell good, just so you know. There were a lot of unpleasant smells in Rome. <laughs> People, animals, other things, right? But at the triumph, as the victorious general and his armies made their way through the streets of Rome, their servants carried censers filled with perfumes and burning incense that would send a sweet-smelling aroma into the air, onto the crowd, all about. The streets were also lined with flowers, and it was common for people to throw flowers out onto the victorious army. And as those flowers were trampled upon, they released even more of their scent. And so there's this wonderful smell, not like your average day in Rome. And as the Roman soldiers, as they made their way through the streets of Rome, and they heard those cheers from the crowds of victory, and they were smelling the incense, they were smelling the flowers, they smelt the aroma of victory, of triumph. But then there were those who were brought in chains. The conquered army, their king, the generals, the officials, they smelled the same smell. But to them, it was not the smell of victory. To them, it was the smell of defeat. And it spoke to them that their death was probably very near. To one, it was the aroma of life, victory. To the other, it was the smell of defeat, death. Well, God, he desires, he desires to use us to disperse the fragrance of Christ, the knowledge of him everywhere. Where's everywhere? Hmm. Ah, it's everywhere. <laughs> Where you work? Oh, yeah. Where you work. In your home? Oh, yes. In your home. Your neighbor's house? Yeah, there too. The beach, yes. Um, on holiday, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, everywhere. To be the fragrance of Christ, everywhere. Yeah. And people will respond. They will be drawn or they will be repelled. That's what happens. We should expect that. People's rejection is not our responsibility. Yeah, unless we're overly stinky in ourselves. <laughs> Our responsibility is to be as much of a fragrance of Christ as we can and allow people to respond to that. And you know, we don't want to be a strong scent of the world and Jesus together because that's confusing. If a Christian is living in compromise, living a worldly lifestyle, yet proclaiming Christ, and there's a bit of the fragrance there, it's confusing. That fragrance is confusing. I was a hippie type person, I guess. And I worked at a, a bead store on the beach in California. A bead store. What is that? Well, it has lots of beads. 
And you make necklaces and earrings and all that sort of stuff. It was actually a pretty good job until they fired me for being a Christian. Now, I worked with the other employees, as you do, and the other employees, most of them were, were, were ladies, and they were very natural ladies who didn't use deodorant. Should, I'll say that again. They didn't use deodorant, okay? But they would scent themselves with oil, patchouli oil, if you're familiar with that. I can't stand it to this day. And so they would anoint themselves with that oil, but then they didn't use any deodorant. And we worked in a very small shop in California with lots of people in it in the summertime. Summertime. No AC. I can attest to you that the patchouli oil did not work. There was a scent of patchouli oil and something else. Yeah? It wasn't a good smell was not nice, especially to be around for hours on end. <laughs> to live a life of compromise is to taint the fragrance of Christ with the odor of the world, and it, it's confusing to people. It will have an impact on those around us because they're trying to figure out, well, I thought I smelled something different, but no, I, I think I just smell the world. Hmm. Yeah. That they would smell Jesus through our lives. In Christ, all of us bear the fragrance of Christ to one degree to another. You know, coffees, Tyler will appreciate this, coffees have different strengths on the bag usually. They let you know, oh, there's Mick. He came out of the woodwork when I said coffee. Um, coffees have different, you know, strengths and potency and smells, yeah, and it's on the label, which is which, <laughs> oh, this one's, uh, this one's not that strong, this one's a little, a little light, this is for the, not the real coffee drinker, right, you get the one that's a little bit stronger, well, the question is, for you and I, is how fragrant is our life of Jesus, is it really, is it noticeable, is it noticeable? You know, we all know those believers, those believers that we love to be around because the fragrance of Christ, I mean, it's just so evident in their lives. They're so encouraging to be around because Christ, the fragrance of him is just so evident. Although we all have a measure of the fragrance of Christ, you know that, that strength, that potency of that fragrance it also, it often depends upon how close we are walking with the source. As I said earlier, I, I lived in the United Kingdom for a long time. And for a long time, we had this old piece of furniture, an old dressing table. It looked cool, but man, it didn't smell very good. Yeah. And we had our clothes in there. And so it didn't smell very good. So what do your clothes smell like? Not very good. And so, you know, we would buy bars of soap and put those in there with the clothes, and our clothes started to smell better, and the clothes that were right next to the bar of soap, boy, those smelled mighty good, because they were right next to the bar of soap. How fragrant we are of Jesus often depends how much time we're spending with our Savior. We're allowing Him to work in and through our lives by His Spirit. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, we want to be fragrant in a good way for Jesus. And so let us spend time with the source. Spend time with Jesus in His Word and in prayer, actively seeking to apply His Word to your life so that you'll become more like Him. Seeking to yield to His Spirit. Asking the Spirit every day to fill you, to direct you, to empower you, to reveal Jesus in and through your life. That that fragrance of Christ 
that it would be smelled, that people would know you're different. You know, our, our interaction with people, it can be so powerful and impacting. We went to the petrol station, as you do, and uh, this lady from another country, of course, filling up the petrol, right? And it's hot. She's out there. And uh, the way she spoke, I could tell she was probably pretty well educated, but she's working at the petrol station. She's cleaning our windows. She's doing a great job. And so, you know, I said, you know, we gave her the money. And I said, you know, just keep the change. It's fine. And then my wife said, because she was closer to her, she said, God bless you. Jesus loves you. And she stepped back and she said, that is, those are the nicest words that I have heard all day. All day. I can imagine what she hears throughout the day. Right? And that was just a little thing. Just a little thing. How hard was that for us to do? Well, not very hard. We can do that. We can do that. And God will use you to bring life to life. Oh, there will be those people that will sneer. That's okay, I guess. <laughs> it's not your fault. Don't take it to heart. For them, the fragrance of life is death. But keep sharing Jesus. Yeah. You know, in our, in our interaction with people, we can, in the moment, in the moment, we can ask God, please, give me, give me your wisdom in this moment. Please, help me. To smell like you and not like me. Please, by your spirit. Paul writes this in verse 16. Who is sufficient for these things? Implying that Paul's sufficiency and likewise our sufficiency of being the fragrance of Christ and being led in triumph is from God. It's not from ourselves or anything else. Paul would write in the next chapter, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That's where our sufficiency comes from. And so brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, spend time with the source. Spend time with Jesus. Ask Him daily to empower you by His Spirit to be a witness for Him, to live the life that He has called you to. And be encouraged. When the trials come, the difficulties of perhaps this week, you're being led in triumph in Christ. Even if humanly speaking, it may not look like it. God is leading in victory, whether the world recognizes it or not. What God has promised to do, He does. He will do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray for you.